You are in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen, as Arti Prasad has been one of the superstars of this festival that we've been uh, very proud to present in a number of her different avatars, because unusually she is both scientist, uh, uh, geneticist, archaeologist, and historian, uh, and uh, many other uh, qualities besides, but she's one of those rare Renaissance women who, uh, uh, Renaissance people who spread their, whose abilities spread across different uh, disciplines and who uh, and never allows herself to be boxed within any one category. This book on silk, I had the privilege of, of, of seeing it, some of its early stages. And at one point, um, Artie was growing silk moths in her home, much to her daughter's distress. I don't know if her daughter is here. Um, uh, and uh, these, these worms were nibbling uh, mulberry leaves and, uh, uh, and hatching inside loo rolls, as I seem to remember from Instagram. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, so it's been a, a multidisciplinary research project involving all sorts of uh, uh, strange, uh, strange permutations. But it was something which um, was, took extraordinary directions. And uh, Artie has made ex amazing discoveries about a subject that you would have thought would be quite well and finally researched. Uh, and the book has had a spectacular uh, sale in America and is going to be a, a, a massive hit around the world. So we're very, very proud. Uh, rather than a conversation, uh, I had the bright idea at about sort of half past nine this morning that Artie might like to give a, a, a presentation. So since then, she's been missing her breakfast and uh, uh, her alu parata or her idli samba or whatever she was going to be uh, having has been sacrificed for the PowerPoint, which you're about to see. Um, uh, and so she's, she's a little bit angry with me, I think, for that. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I thought she has such gorgeous illustrations for her. Uh, book and, and lecture that uh, I thought it would be a tragedy not to uh, indulge ourselves with those. So over to her and then we will engage in discussion after. Not having the alu paratha this morning was a massive sacrifice. Um, I'm, 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 I am a scientist, I'm by no means a historian, but I'd love to have a conversation with you, William, because I think there's some crossovers in the, in the histories, especially in India and the scientists that I've been writing about. I came to this topic from a scientific and medical perspective, but I think, I don't know if you agree, but you plan your books very carefully, but the books sometimes take on a life of their own and they become what they want to be and the characters want you to write about them and, and sometimes it's hard to find enough on them, especially when they're women uh, scientists, but I did what I could. So uh, do I, do I yep. just, the idea, the impression, my impression is, and I think historically it's, it's borne out in many places, but not all, that silk is a very special, so economically valuable, but very esteemed and luxurious material. And it has been that way for millennia. And when we think about silk, we think about this. I certainly do. My mother always wore silk saris. I watched, um, families hand-looming it in Melkote in South India. My mother's from the South. And I was always um, fascinated by the, the feel and the, the luxury of the, of the fabric. And all of the silks, the predominantly the silks that I knew about and most people around the world know about and what you're probably wearing now and what I'm wearing now, it is made by a moth that was domesticated in China. And that moth's called the Bombyx mori, and it is the only domesticated insect that, that exists. And this moth did not exist more than about 4,000 years ago. We don't have the genetic studies to validate exactly how old it is, but taken together with archaeological evidence found in graves, for example, in China, we think it's four to five, probably closer to 4,000 uh, years old. And this moth, um, grows by a, a method known as complete metamorphosis. And that means that it starts off in a larval form, like a caterpillar that has, bears no recognition to the adult form. And to do that, it starts off very small and it eats copious amounts of mulberry leaves. That's its favorite food. You can feed it lettuce or carrots, and then its silk will turn green or orange, but it won't be the best quality silk. The best quality silk is when you feed it the white mulberry leaves because there's an ecology um, involved with every insect. 
So it grows and grows and grows, and it becomes a very juicy caterpillar, and then it stops. And that's a really big problem if you're a juicy caterpillar because things are going to eat you. And not just that, if you pause, and during that pause, that's when it's developing into the adult form, it's also prone to bacteria and fungal infections. And that's why silk has incredible uh, properties, uh, which are antibacterial and antifungal to protect the insect. And it's also extremely strong, which I'll come back to. The silk is produced in glands running along the caterpillar's body, and then it comes out from the salivary glands as a liquid, and when it hits the air, it becomes a thread. And that thread is a thousand times thinner than a human hair, but it's extraordinarily strong. And the reason it's strong, pardon the molecular structure, is because it has a very, very, very boring and repetitive structure that keeps uh, yeah, repeating itself. Um, but it gives us incredible strength. And that strength has been known about obviously, particularly in the East, in China, in India, um, also in ancient Greece, where it was used for silk surgical suturing, and it still is, um, because it has these um, an, um, antibacterial properties, for example, and it's also a natural animal protein that can heal into the body. But because of its strength, it was used by Genghis Khan's um, army as a thin undershirt, not just because it was a light armor, but because when you're hit by an arrow, that's not the worst part about being hit by an arrow. The worst part is when you have to take the arrow out. And so the silk uh, will twist with the arrow, and make it easier for the arrow to be removed, but also mesh into the wound and allow wound healing. So these, these sorts of things were known. It's also been used for bulletproof armor. There was a doctor in the Wild West who was actually married to a woman called Colt, whose family made the, the guns in the Wild West, and he noticed that people who were wearing, you know the Wild West think they're wearing heavy denim clothes, right? They're wearing uh, felted hats, and the bullets went straight through them, but when they had a silk handkerchief in their pocket folded a certain number of times, the bullet could not penetrate to, to, to leave their bodies. Um, the Nazis loved, uh, loved silkworms. They gave it to school children and, and teachers, and they said, uh, cultivate it, and they used it as a lesson in eugenics, they were completely misled because they said, <laughs> you know, you can see that when you have uh, silkworms that are sick, you need to throw them out. But of course, these silkworms, because they've been domesticated, are completely inbred and they have been for 4,000 years, aka pure blooded. And that's why they, had, they suffer from a lot of um, illnesses. So the, there's a real mystery about how silk got from China, not the silk fabric but the technology to grow the silkworm, to cultivate it, to even know what it is. And there's a lot of mythology about that. There's these stories from um, uh, uh, um, Justinian's time by um, a writer called Procopius, and he says that two monks came from India, and they had an empty stick, and in the stick they put the eggs of silkworms, and they walked, and they would have had to walk for two years. So the first point is silk moth eggs will hatch in two months, so he you couldn't possibly walk for two years with it. Um, secondly, what would they have eaten? And thirdly, what they called India probably wasn't India. It was Central Asia. And so we know that certainly by about 300 BC, there were uh, silk, um, silk moth cultivation in the Taran Basin. But what's really interesting about that is they, did, they worked the silk in a different way. So in China, the moths... Uh, when they wrap themselves in a cocoon, and one cocoon, if you unravel the thread, would give you two to three kilometers of unbroken um, silk. But the only way to get the unbroken thread, which is how you get the beautiful luster and sheen and continuity, is to unfortunately stifle or boil the pupa, and that's not very nice for, for the worms. So what you see in the Tarim Basin when Buddhism comes in is they start letting the moth escape. Then what happens is, in order to escape from the cocoon, the moth vomits uh, an enzyme, and that enzyme is a kind of rusty red color. So it stains, I still have the stains on my fireplace. It doesn't go anywhere, it's, it's not what you want. It stains the beautiful white silk, but it also makes a big hole in it, breaking the threads, and therefore you have to tie them together. And you know that you see this in peace silk, or wild, um, peace silk, raw silk, where you see the little novels in it, which, which I think is very beautiful, but if you didn't, you would you'd have to kill the insect. 
And from there, it went into Kushan territory that was also included in the north of India, Mesopotamia, Persia. And Persia had a good thing going on because they stood in the way of Rome from getting um, the silk. So Rome got silk um, fabric and they unraveled it and they wove it in with cotton threads because it was so expensive. And they had no idea, it said, where this material came from. And they thought it grew on trees, which I'll come back to because they may not have been completely uh, mistaken. And finally, it got west. So Italy and France were the first places. Italy was the first place that had the silk uh, cultivation, um, and they're still very good at it. And then it got to England quite late, so sort of 17th century, where King James hired a silk um, advisor-in-chief and tried to cultivate it in England. It failed, but the British by then had gone to America, set up Jamestown, named after him, and wanted to cultivate it there, where they had a different species of mulberry called red mulberry, uh, which the worms can eat, but it's not the best silk. Uh, but the silk cultivation failed there because they found this thing called tobacco, and that really took off instead. So this is all Chinese silk. And what many people don't know, uh, many of you may know, but what um, I hadn't really thought very deeply about was that there are other moths, moths that have been used for a very long time all around the world, from Mexico to Madagascar, Cameroon to India. It's just that, as um, one archaeologist, Irene Good, who's at Harvard, said, uh, if you find fabric in China, you probably test it to see whether it was silk. But if you find it in any other country, you, you wouldn't. You'd assume it was some other fabric. These, this is a, a, a silk moth from Suriname. It was found by a woman called Maria Sibylia Marianne in 1700. She was an incredible uh, scientist. She was never called a scientist because she was a woman and she wasn't allowed into the scientific academies. So we don't have her publications, but we have her magnum opus, which is this book she wrote in... Um, in South America. Um, obviously, this was a time when European scientists were going out into the colonies and finding things. Obviously, the indigenous people who were already there knew all about it and were already using it to make silk. She sent this back to Holland, where she was living, to Amsterdam, to have it tested um, for silk. But on her way back from Suriname to Amsterdam, she took an indigenous Surinamese woman who probably wrote the book with her but she was never named, so we, we have no idea who she is. This is a very similar moth from Indonesia, and this was uh, recorded by, in Europe by a scientist called um, Georg Everard Rumpf, who went blind because he studied insects so hard. <laughs> um, but most of, the, most of the wild silk moths, and this has been known for a long time, are in India. And that's been a very significant thing, particularly when the British Empire realized that. I mean, in this, this book, it's a Dictionary of Economic Products of India, you, you must know it, um, William. There is um, substantial sections, it's alphabetical, covering a lot of things, but you know, um, silver managed five pages and spices. I mean, honestly, spices only seven and a half, but but um, silk covered a large part of it, and it's because of the number of wild silk moths that, they, that there are. And these weren't fully domesticated, like the Chinese one was, but some of them are partially domesticated, but many of them are allowed to continue living in their ecologies, in the forests, the cocoons are collected. Yes, they're broken, but they're used to make um, silk. So these studies were, again, there are many studies, and this is something that really surprised me because I was never told of all these women scientists who were working on, on natural history at this time. This is the Gilbert, uh, her work, Isabella uh, Gilbert. The moths that she drew were drawn by the Gilbert artist, who we don't know. Um, and these are nothing like the little Chinese moths, the domesticated moths have lost all of their coloration. They cannot fly, they're born blind. They need humans to feed them and for them to mate. But these, and they're, they're about maybe three centimeters long, but these wild moths are immense. They're huge, they're beautiful. Um, they make a very interesting kind of silk. How many of you have, uh, have seen wild silks or worn wild silks from India? 
you'll know the quality is a little bit different. And the, the uh, silks are, are robust, they're good for colder weather, they're passed on from generation to generation as well. And a lot of them are made from um, these, these, which are the tussar moth. And as you would notice from these drawings, this is Roxburgh, who had the botanical gardens at uh, Calcutta. The cocoon is hanging from something that looks like a stick, the pediment. And so I know, you know, with all the Roman interactions that they had with India, maybe they saw this because Georg Rump, who was studying in Indonesia, also said that they seemed to be growing on trees. And, and this could be where that um, idea came from. So these were early illustrations going back to the six, uh, 17th and 18th century. And there was an impression that the British had that um, silk had been used in India, and I'm talking about wild silks since time immemorial, and they absolutely had. Because this scientist I mentioned at Harvard who started looking for wild silks where no one else was, she was in Harvard at Boston and she found in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts some early artifacts that were brought out of several Indus Valley sites, and there were jewelry there. And inside the jewelry were threads. And those threads were from different species of moths. And the reason she figured that out was because the shape of the thread reflects the orifice from which it comes out in the different moths. And so she looked at it under a microscope and was able to say that there were three distinct types, which are the Thesser, Eri, and Muga, which are still used uh, to this day. And they traveled a long distance to get to Punjab and, um, and the Sindh because they came from, uh, many of them from Assam. So this was a very interesting alternative um, silk road for wild silks. So the point I want to make is that there are an incredible variety of insects that make silk, but particularly moths that make silk, and particularly moths in India where there's an immense variety. And that for me, because I'm a scientist and I came to this because of my interest in technology and regenerative medicine, is, is incredibly interesting because these silks are very, very strong because the domesticated silk moth did not have to deal with the environment for 4,000 years because we looked after them. Whereas these moths lived in the wild, they had to deal with their environment, they had to adapt to pathogens. And so, as a result, the silk fibers of wild moths display um, a breaking strength, that's the amount of stress you have to place on it before it breaks. That's very interesting because they almost reflect the holy grail of silk to scientists, which is spider silk. All of the, the technology, technologies from silk are being made. And the reason I find silk so interesting is I think it is the only material that is so ancient, that has been in ancient use, has been used continuously, and has a very, very surprising future. And that's, okay, we know about medicine and surgery. Genghis Khan knew about that. The ancient Indians knew about that. But it's also being used now for uh, electronic sensors and you know, uh, also plastics, because we know what to do with hydrocarbons, we know how to make plastics, but this is a natural biodegradable material. The plastics are a problem, but one of the greater problems probably is electronic waste. What do we do with our computers and our mobile phones and laptops? And this is what scientists are now, now working on creating using silk, and that's all silk from Bombix Mori. Um, in terms of stifling the poor little worms, this is Professor Neri Oxman at MI, when she was at MIT Media Lab. She created an architectural structure and she placed thousands of silkworms on it and asked them to build it for her. And so they, could, they became moths, but they built the structure. And this is, I'm thinking about the future of sustainability and the impacts that silk would have on this. So as I was saying, this is why India is very interesting and wild silk is extremely interesting because these have a mag magnitude similar to a very strong spider silk. Now spiders have many kinds of silk. They wrap their eggs in one type, they make their dro drop lines from one type, they make their webs from one type. And the tensile strength is five times tougher than steel. And scientists say, if a spider was the size of a human, the web that we made, would be strong enough to stop a jet liner in its path. 
And so over the years, that picture at the bottom is one of the very um, terrible contraptions that were variously called guillotines and, and other things, where you immobilize the spider and you pull the silk directly out of it. Because the great problem with spiders that we don't have with moths is they're not very cooperative. So Simon Pierce said to me, so Simon Pierce worked with this spider, the golden orb spider from Madagascar. They're spread across the Pacific and Australia and they make a golden web and it's about um, um, a meter to two meters uh, wide. Um, and he managed to make a large textile that was displayed in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And do you have, you have, you have something made of spider silk, do you? <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's a good use of spider silk. <laughs> um, but he said that he, he took... Right. Yeah. Uh, I, we, when you come into our house in Delhi, we have a spider silk lumber, which is the Madagascan... It was originally used for, uh, for wrapping bones in, in the Madagascan religion. Uh, and our fr mutual friend, Simon Piers, um, began collecting these spiders and rewarded people for bringing in spiders to him. So he had thousands of spiders arriving on his doorstep. Uh, uh, and he started weaving this thing again for the first time for 100 years. But the, um, what he encountered at first when he had uh, Malagasy women were going out to collect these spiders in baskets. And um, I think it took him, uh, it was it? millions of spiders in several years. And he said that's because when the women came back with a basket that they've just filled with spiders, there'd just be one very happy spider left in the basket because she had eaten all the others. And so the problem with getting spider silk is you can't get and much... It's definitely a she, was it? There are she, yeah. The males are, males are about this big, the females are about this big. Um, yeah, they rule the roost. And they're the ones who make these... Uh, web, the spiders you see in your house with the webs will be, will be females um, as well. So respect them. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, they're not cooperative. They're cannibalistic. No, they, um, they hang out, you know. They hang us on. Gold diggers. <laughs> Um, so, try, and this is in trying to solve the problem, they created these contraptions where they'd put, and this is painful for the spider, they didn't use anesthetic. Um, and so, it's, since then, lots of other methods have been tried. So, this is Randy Lewis, he's a professor, I think, in Colorado in the U USA. And at first, I think the scientists were using contraptions to pull silk out, but then they started using genetic modification. That means you take a section of spider silk DNA and you put it into bacteria like E. coli because bacteria reproduce very quickly and as they reproduce you get some silk protein out of it. That wasn't great so they used yeast, the same kind of yeast we make beer with. That didn't work either. So he went on to mammals and this is a spider goat. This goat is genetically modified. It carries some of the DNA of the spider that creates the silk protein and when you milk the goat, in the milk is silk. Um, Protein. But the problem is, the strength of silk is not just... Um, Can we do this with our goats? What's that? Can we do this with our goats? Can we turn well, them into spin you, they're on a farm. silk spinning? Well, the, the bottom line, which you've anticipated, didn't work either. So the goats are now on farm. So if you'd like one, I can ask him for you. <laughs> um, but the thing is, the strength of spider silk and moth silk is not just because of that molecular structure that I showed you. When the silk emerges from the glands of the spider, you have each gland making a different type of silk, one for the eggs, one for the... I mean, it's, it's miraculous, really. Um, when it emerges, the protein folds, it conforms in a certain way, and that folding gives it strength. So if you end up with a liquid containing a partial amount of DNA from a spider, I would not call that spider silk, and therefore it doesn't have the properties. And what Randy told me he's done now, he's gone back to Chinese silk moths, put in spider DNA into them because he said they've been doing it for 4,000 years. So hopefully that's going to create something. But the point is, the big problem is we can't get enough of the stuff to, to make things. But I just wanted to end by saying that um, spiders and moths are not the only things that make silk. This is the Pinanobulus. It's been used in the Mediterranean. It's spread from North Africa, Libya, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Albania, all across. And um, it's about a meter tall. This was a photograph taken in Taranto, in Italy, in the early part of the 20th century. I don't know if you eat mussels, I don't, I'm vegetarian, but in, you know, the blue mussels, there's a little thread at the foot, and they attach themselves to rocks with it. 
Well, these are a meter tall, and the, the, the threads from them are about this long. And they variously turn gold, green, um, brown, and they've been woven into uh, materials. This is a, a scarf made in the 1930s before Mussolini came and co-opted all the weaving looms to make Orbace, which was a very um, a tough uh, uniform for the, for the fascist um, soldiers. Um, there's also a little shrimp-like creature that makes a, um, uh, it spins a thread that's halfway between the strength of spider silk and the cement that barnacles use to attach themselves to the hulls of ships. Um, and these things are really interesting technologically because that's, a, that's an, um, an adhesive that works underwater. And we can't do that, right? And these pinanobulus, these big, these big mollusks, their threads are self-healing. So imagine if we can make materials that heal themselves. And so this is how I came to it, and I just wanted to end by saying we have a real problem in this world. And I was amazed when I interviewed the scientists working on silk, is they weren't so interested in the medical applications anymore, but the sustainability applications. And as scientists say, you know, we, with all our technology, have failed as yet to be able to do what spiders are able to do on a diet of bugs. But silk is a great place to start, and, and, and they are trying. Thank you. Arti, you, you said very confidently at the beginning that the, the silkworm was domesticated in China. But I remember when you were first working on this, you told me that the species of moth which was domesticated is native to Assam and that you believe that it's quite possible that it was domesticated in India first. Do you still believe that, or have you been persuaded that the, the, the normal wisdom is true? It's very hard from archaeology to understand the cultural ideas or the ritual ideas of any... I'm, I'm working on a, a, a Roman a cremation site in Pompeii and Rome, and we're looking at ritual, but how do you know what people did and what they thought? So, like in the Tarim Basin, it may be that people didn't want to domesticate them. The Chinese moth was domesticated from from a moth called Bombyx mandarina moor that is spread from China across the, um, the Himalayas and into India. So they well could have domesticated. Maybe they made attempts at it. Maybe they didn't want to. Maybe uh, they did and then it stopped because the other moths weren't domesticated. And while, completely. if we accept the first domestication to be in China, how old is the Indus Valley silk that you found? On, Contemporaneous the with Chinese silk. So we could do a big nationalistic thing here and reinvent India as the first, the home of the home of the silk. It was. And the, that no, will the, really the, put the Chinese out. I think the point is <laughs> China was, there's, the reason I, all the books I write are about different things, but the, what connects them is changing a perspective that we think we know something. And, and the point is silk was never from one place. People all around the world used it. The I remember you also mentioned Chios. There's an island in, in Greece. Yes, so they were Greek wild moths that were woven there. How early? Um, that I can't say, but, but I... I mean, very early, though. Very so early, five, yeah, no. 500 BC or that sort earlier of thing. Earlier than that. Yeah. Earlier than that. Um, Did they export it? Did they know what they'd got? Well, they, they did know what they had, <laughs> but... Um, the, these wild moth species made different kinds of silk. I think when the Chinese silk was seen, because they killed the moth, the threads were fine, and also the luster of the fabric was different, and that was quite amazing. So the wild silk is a different type of, of beast completely. But yeah, I think in, in India, uh, some moths were semi-domesticated. They well could have domesticated the ancestor, the Chinese silk moths. We, we don't know. We what's, need more evidence. What's the first evidence for domesticated silk in India? Um, is, is the Indus Valley. Domesticated as opposed to wild moths, because the, the pictures you showed us were, yeah. were wild silk. Yeah. yeah. Domesticated silk? Yeah, because also. they can tell from the... Um, they can tell from the threads whether they were broken or not, and some of them weren't broken, which meant that they were practicing the same method of stifling or boiling the cocoon. There was some way of getting the silk without breaking it. They, so I think they did both, and they still do both. With wild silk in India, they still do both. Some of them are um, semi-domesticated, and some of them are completely wild. That's so interesting, because if you press um, people that talk about the silk roads, they 
soon start talking about how all the silk which is arriving in Rome in the early centuries, whether it's from China or not, is coming through Indian ports. That it's not crossing, they're at war with Persia. So Persia has blocked the road. Uh, and it's flowing through Gujarat, through Baruch, and particularly through Kerala, Muziris, and, and Patnam. And if it's coming through Gujarat, I mean, you know, That's they'd been working on silk for 4,000 years as well, 2,000 years by then. Um, Is anyone working on this in a detailed way, the, 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 Indian, the Indian prehistory of the silk? No, but I had a great conversation with a Chinese scientist at Harvard, and he's just got some funding, and we were discussing uh, my book, and he said, I'm going to start looking at these origins of Chinese silk, but I think we'll also start talking about the other sources. The point is you have to have archaeologists who are willing to, when they excavate in Indian sites, look out for fabric and see what it was. Because if you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. This is the point. It's invisible because we're not aware that the, and it's not just the presence of the silk. The ancient Indians had the technology to weave it, to dye it, to um, extract it, you know, to twist it. We see the different twists. I'm not a textile expert. That's what they're doing with cotton at the same time, it's also out of cotton. Gujarat. And sometimes and cotton, bizarrely, at that stage, is more expensive than silk when it's exported. So, if yeah. you look at there's some um, in very interesting papers I read about silk in, in in India in ancient times, and there were different names for them because there was one that came from. China, but there were many others as well. And the taxes weren't levied as high uh, because people wore them in, in, in an ordinary way. And I saw this, I went to uh, Sufli in Greece, which is on the Greek-Turkish border. And when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the border that dropped down that piece of land, you see Turkey and the river on one side and Greece on the other. The worms were on the Turkish side and the mulberry trees were on the other. So they were in a, in a bit of... Um, in a bit of conundrum. a in a bit of a, a conundrum. Um, sorry, I lost my thread. You were asking about the. The other thing I'm interested in is the Kushans. How important yeah. are the Kushans? Because they're, they're, they're always the, the forgotten dynasty. We always in this country get very excited about the Guptas, um, who seem to have had a smaller geographical spread, and the Kushans, because they're perceived of as as, as Central Asian invaders again, uh, are often eclipsed in the, in the narrative that we tell of, of, of Indian history. And yet, the more you look, and certainly the story I've been telling lately, which is the, the researching the spread of Buddhism, it's the fact that the Kushans straddle both sides of the Himalayas uh, and, and have a, one foot in the Tarim Basin, the Kashgar, and another foot in the Indian plains means that Buddhism can go north. Suddenly, uh, although you've got an invasion coming into India, it opens the floodgates for Indian monks to go north. Are you finding the same thing with silk? Yeah, so I'll just, um, on the point you were making before, it's that because, they are, because fabrics don't survive very well in archaeology, what you look at is spindle walls and devices used for weaving. And with cotton, they tend to be bigger, but sometimes you find very, very fine ones, and that also is a clue. So these are the kind of things we need to look out for. Yes, with the cushions, the, um, the, tr the travel of... Do we have, do we have s specifically silk spindle walls for... Indus Valley? That I can't remember, but I, it, it'll be... Such a, a major subject. I mean, it'd be great if we could do it, this. It, people need to look more at it. And I find even with um, bioarchaeology from the Indus Valley, it's not, uh, and archaeobotany, not as well recorded. But, um, for example, we, the session we just had now was about migration of plants and people. But the migration of plants is really interesting. And you see a very early... Um, uh, m migration of products with people, and it's the same with silk. If people were, um, the product moved with the empires, and if this is the region they span, then we assume that this is the region to where the goods important to them went. And by the way, the, there's a mythology around the preciousness of <coughs> Chinese silk to China and the idea of espionage that, oh, China didn't allow the technology to go out. And I'm not really convinced that's true because they did share it with Korea, with Japan, with the Mongols. So um, the idea that they didn't share the weaving technology, because it's not just about the moth. How do you cultivate it, but how do you weave it? You start seeing this in the Tarim Basin, the same ways and different ways. So were the, were the craftspeople moving? Probably. But then were local people adopting new ways of weaving it, probably also. What you do see very early in China, though, is the monetization of silk, where silk is being used as an alternative to currency. Yes. And, and border tribes are paid in, in bundles of silk rather than in cash, rather than in gold. And 
one of the interesting things that been turning up in the archaeology is that India is full of Roman coin hoards. China is not. Now, you can interpret that two ways. Is it because the, Ch the Romans are not trading with China, which is quite possible because they weren't really very sure where China was? Or is it that the Chinese are just paying for all their goods in silk and not dealing in, in, in gold? As a, I mean, there's no reason you, that gold and coins should be the the only it's, currency. I mean, it's very likely. And Chinese silk was very expensive. It's very, um, there's a lot of technology that goes into the making and the dyeing of it. The thing about Chinese silk, which is more difficult for Indian silk, is the dyeing. So until Thomas Wardle, who was, um, he was uh, from the north of England, Macclesfield, he was knighted by Queen Victoria for services to silk. And that's because he started bringing Indian wild silk. He formulated a way uh, using natural dye. He worked with William Morris, who's a bit of a bastard. He had to kick him out of his house, but it was about using indig indigos. Not He was a chemist, but he wanted to find ways of dyeing um, of, um, wild silks. And he did find gem, beautiful range of gem colors. So the Chinese silk, had a quality for many years that the wild silks didn't. And so it was very precious. But the point I was saying about souffle is that for a long time, the most common fabric they had in souffle was silk because all the women had it. So you had a situation where women were wearing aprons made of it and using it in a very common way. So um, in India, it was the same. When there's an excess of a product, it doesn't, it's not that valuable, but I think the Chinese silk held its value because what you said about Persia was stopping the Western markets and keeping up the mystery of what this thing was and how you get it and how you work it. They it's didn't exactly have the, the actual same with, with cotton. Cotton, which again, we think of as a much more everyday subject. We're wearing it any, any, without thinking about it. Yeah. But the Romans regarded it as, as a wonderful thing because it was the, the most um, suitable textile for a hot climate, and it was considered a luxury product. I think, yeah, we ha I think we have to think beyond the actual luxurious fabric to what is also important today, which is intellectual property. I think it's not just the, the material, but how did they make it and work it? And so I, I don't know that much about cotton, but uh, it's the probably the case. The thing that makes me very suspicious of this idea of Chinese border controls, which yours, is we've always got to remember that quite a lot of what is within the modern boundaries of China in the Tarim Basin, such as uh, Kashgar, Yarkand, Khotan, and so on, were independent kingdoms as late as the 6th century, which is 800 years after the domestication of silk. So if you've got silk being made in, the, uh, in, in those regions on the, on the south slopes of the Himalayas, there's a major trade route, for example, from Khotan and Yarkand to Leh, to Ladakh. Uh, and there's no reason that that technology couldn't pass backwards and forwards. I have the sense that Merv and Turk, well now of Turkmenistan was the first place where the silk eggs and cultivation first got to from China and then and then moved west, uh, which was a place of great learning, uh, libraries and uh, until Merv, Merv. And, until uh, Turk Genghis Khan, Khan came along and, and killed three three million people in a week. It was incredible. So they, um, people came out of the walls to escape, but they drove them all back in. And then when they killed everyone, uh, when they killed everyone, they then had a call to prayer to see who'd come out. And then they killed them too. But they did not kill the artisans. They kept the artisans. And yeah. amongst them would be the silk makers. Yeah. So I, I have reason to... I mean, this is... Uh, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I think we've probably got to open it up to yeah. the audience now, but uh, please, uh, hands up for anyone. This gentleman here. First big hand of applause for Artie Prasad. <laughs> I've just broken my spectacles this morning, so I'm going to have to use them as a sort of pince nez when I see. This gentleman here with his hand up. Hello. Uh, so my question is based on archaeological lens. It's from the archaeological lens. So, uh, like, how much importance uh, historians give to the archaeological discoveries which happened or are happening right now? Because largely the history is the same, what we uh, learn and what we have in our texts. So I want to ask about that. Because uh, archaeological surveys are very legitimate uh, kind of thing, scientific thing to find out what history was. So, yeah. 
Is that, what's the role of archaeology in all this? You, 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 as the historian, I'd be interested to hear what you think, but my personal experience, because I do archaeology from science, so I do genetic archaeology, and there are people who are still very resistant to it. I, I find there they can be two tribes of archaeologists, one who want the archival and historical data, but not the scientific or genetic data. So I think there's still scope for history and archaeological science to work more together to answer questions like this that cannot be answered in, in other ways. I don't know what you think, William. I think they're two very different worlds, and often they're suspicious of each other. And, and, and obviously, with um, any archaeology that's dealing with the historical period as opposed to the prehistoric, preliterate period, to use textual basis um, is, 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 you know, the two clearly have got to come together and be used together, but uh, they're often not. Next, the gentleman here with the, yep, with the white arm sticking out of the, or both of you, yeah, one than the other. We need some ladies, Where, and there's a, any more ladies here? Here's a lady. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> thank you so much for this brilliant session. I like wearing silk. I'm actually carrying an airy silk uh, one that you mentioned here okay. as well, airy silk uh, shawl. Okay. Uh, but uh, my question is also about uh, what you mentioned towards the end, which is silkworms as food, because I have had them and they're very tasty. Uh, so what I wanted to know, I, I have had them in Assam all the times that I uh, ate them. Uh, they are widely available in Assam. Uh, a place that was mentioned repeatedly in the session as well. So my question was about uh, silkworms as food or as delicacy. And uh, and the question is very simple. One, is it only a Siam or the Northeast where it's eaten or is it eaten in many places, most of the places that you mentioned as well? And two, is it only one kind of silkworm that's mostly eaten or is it uh, all the different silks that people eat? I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I know it's eaten in China, but I don't know uh, beyond us. Um, I think that um, the, um, the cycle of the boiling the silk uh, cocoons to get the threads means that the pupa is left, and that does give you a food source, so it's not entirely wasteful, but it can also be used for fertilizers and, and other things. I wouldn't think that the wild moths are eaten because they're allowed to escape, so you wouldn't be able to to get your hands on the pupa, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how they were cooked. Were they roasted or how did you? Yeah, they dry fry. Dry fry, are they, are they salty? What do they taste like? They're sold in restaurants. They're uh, easily available in the tribal restaurants. So I have mostly have them in Kabi restaurants, Boro restaurants, which are some tribes from Assam. And because they're generally sold uh, fried, so they go great with, they, they go very well with drinks. How big are they? <laughs> they're very small ones. They're these, very small. These, if size. they're very small ones, then they're the Chinese moth. They're the Bombix <laughs> Mori. Yeah. This is not where I thought this conversation was going. <laughs> no, but it's a very important point. We have a point microphone because, for this lady here, please. I think it's an important point because one of the things about I was saying about plastics and electronics, so humans are wasteful. We waste everything. And our, nature doesn't do that. And so the ability to use every part of something is really important. And so this is not a bad um, idea. <laughs> You talked about a scientist cooperating with silk moths to make a structure, but it's not like the silk moths were signed up to a pay scale or you know given days mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. So what is, could you talk a little bit about the ethics of silk? At the end of the day, they're boiled and stifled. So just a little insight on and that. And then dry fried in Assam, finally. And, and fried in Assam. And they go well with everything. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a really important consideration. And, um, so what I'm interested in is biomimetics. So it's learning how to copy nature rather than extracting from nature. Because as a scientist, you do destroy animal. You do destroy nature in, in order to find answers. And I think what these scientists are trying to do is not use the animals eventually, is to understand the, how we can make the proteins ourselves without having to collect the spiders. Um, et cetera. So that, I think that's known and understood and that's w like the, the scientists who are, got them worms to create the structure without killing them. Um, for Do most of the, the silk fabrics we use, they are destroyed, but yeah, th this is something that's on, on the minds of, of, because sustainability has to be an important part of it. So this lady here, thank you, yes. Do you know anything about uh, do you know anything about mushroom silk? Because it's uh, the warp is cotton and the weft is silk because 
the tribe believes that it's haram to wear silk next to your skin. The, the who believes, sorry? The tribe that uses mushroom silk. They believe There's a tribe that uses mushroom silk? Yeah. I mean, I know, I know about mushroom silk because it's being used. There's a company in America that are using various... Uh, also, Stella McCartney's making handbags out of it, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's being used by designers. Uh, I would, you see, mm, it, silk is a very specific thing. And the moth silk and the spider silk, the molecular structure are very similar. And that defines the quality of silk. For the mollusks and the shrimp, it's different. It's a different structure entirely. So we wouldn't, you know, the the mollusks mollusks blow mold it um, rather than spinning it. I, 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 it's it's a mushroom fabric. It probably it's very smooth, but I wouldn't um, call it silk. But if it's a if it's a um, if it's an alternative to silk for ethical reasons, then you know we we can only welcome it because, again, the mushrooms are widely spread, readily available, cheap to make, and uh, naturally biodegradable. So I would think that's a, a great thing. Uh, is Suresh Kumar in the room? No. He, he's written fascinatingly about um, early Indian exports. And I'd be very good to, interested to ask him, but anyway. In early Indian exports from Indus Valley. I'm longing to know whether silk was, was sent out. From... Uh, one, more, one final question before we run out of time. Gentleman with gray hair at the back. The problem is, is fabrics don't tend to survive and yeah. fine fabrics don't tend to survive. So sometimes you look at potteries for imprints or the presence of spindle yep. rolls, but yeah, it's hard to know about the exports. You mentioned that uh, tensile strength of silk is much more than that of steel. Uh, can you tell me any <coughs> application where uh, silk has replaced uh, steel? Well, it's being used for um, replacements for Kevlar and bulletproof vests. That have been tested and proven to be um, uh, proven to be uh, effective. Um, it's um, it's it's being trialed in a number of ways. But it ha the the things that it has been already used for is in surgical applications where um, people with vocal cord injuries have walked into surgery not being able to speak and walked out being able to. Um, it's also been used to stabilize vaccines and drugs, so you know from the pandemic, but also trying to get medicines into rural areas where there's no refrigeration. So silk has been used to stabilize drugs and vaccines and penicillin for the, over a decade now. Um, so it's not just the applications in strength, but they, uh, it's also not just about the fabric, but how it's woven. So when the Nazis, the reason they were cultivating silkworms was to make parachutes out of silk. And the way that they wove it made it fu <laughs> fire ignore, retardant. Ig ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> made it fire retardant. So it's not just the strength of the silk, but how it's used in order to make the fabrics for the technological applications. Um, and one more, this final question for this lady with the glasses here. I just wanted to clarify that she said mushroom silk and not mushroom. So mushroom is a word where the silk is mixed with cotton. Oh, it's not mushroom. So Sorry, because there is a mushroom silk. <laughs> okay. Mushroom, mushroom. It's a uh, uh, Urdu word, I think. Uh. Arabic word, yeah. So because silk is halal, so it's cotton on one side and silk on the other. So that was what she was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've read about that. Also in Cordoba, in the Islamic empires in Spain, they were doing the same things, <laughs> weaving it with other fabrics, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've never heard of mushroom silk. Well, thank you very much, all of you. We can all go off and have nice fried silkworms now. And <laughs>